All right, today is Monday, the 25th of August. The goal today is to go through as much of chapters 9, 10, and 11 of the book, the Programming in C book, as we can. If we get through all that, you know, we should get close if we don't, but if we get through all that, great. Then when you come in here on Wednesday, I'll have your first assignment. Wednesday will be lab, and next Monday will be lab. No, can't be, because we're not here. So Wednesday will be lab, and next Wednesday will be lab, all right? So you'll have two straight lab periods, all right? After we get done with that, we're only through what, like week three? But then I'm going to spend some time, probably the entire week, going over chapters 12 through 19. I may or may not even give you another assignment then. Then we're ready to move to the, into the next phase, which is the Objective C stuff, all right? I've got some little fly that's flying in front of my face. <laughs> So if you're following along, I'm at the beginning of chapter 9, so I'm on page 165, and that's where we're going to start from. So we've gone through the first, what, 164 pages. That's what we did in the last class, and now we're going into working with structures. Now, I want to mention something because I wish like crazy the author hadn't done this. There's absolutely nothing wrong with what he's done here. There's nothing wrong with that, all right? You can see how pretty it's going to copy, as always. But So there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing this. But the author, I think at least, misses a key point by showing you this. I'm trying to replicate the same picture that you see on the top of page 166 in your book. Again, nothing at all wrong with the example, except when you have structures the stuff that goes in the guts in between the curly braces does not have to be the same data type. Now, if you started reading that chapter, you may or may not have realized that. So I could have a character in here, I could have a string, I could have a double, I could have a boolean. You can combine any and everything. All right, as you'll see when we get to that chapter, in chapter 11, you can have pointers in here, you can have arrays in here. All right, you can have arrays of structures and structures that contain arrays. So there's a lot more than what the author mentions here. I think the reason he does it like this, I don't know, I didn't write the program, or the book rather, but I think the reason that he does this is he just wants to start you on simple. All right. Quite often when you're working with programs like this, so if we have the pound include stdio.h, and let's just say all we're going to have in here is a main. All right, we'll just keep it simple. That's all we're going to have in here. So int main void. All right. And then we'll have some other stuff in here that we'll get to in just a minute. Quite often when you're working with structures, you do define them at the top of the program so that they're global to the program. All right. And I think that's why he's showing that. He will he's, he doesn't show it right away, but he will show it a little bit later. All right. So, if we do this, then this right here, what you see in blue, that's now a new data type. I want you to understand it. That is now a new data type. So in your program, in main, if I go, now that's a new data type. If the variable is called today, it is of type struct data. So when I go filling it up, it'll hold an integer that's called month, an integer that's called day, and an integer that's called year. All right? So. They're showing it here, and then the, the syntax is a little different for it because, as you see on the middle of page 167, it's today dot month. Since it's integer, I'll say 8, today dot day, line it up so it's nice and pretty, equals 25, and... And today.year, we'll set that up equal to 2014. Again, I can pretty it all up, but you get the idea, right? So it's the name of the variable dot the member of the structure. It's In some ways, it is similar to doing objects in, in JavaScript, yes. All right. Now, as we go through this, what you'll see on later pages is when you create a variable like this, all right, when you create a variable like this that 
it's also possible to initialize it. So we could have, and you'll see this, I'm going to leave this here. But one thing they don't show you, I don't know if it's in the chapter or not, but quite often you'll see this. And then you'll see something like this. And you might say, okay, fine. Why would you want to do that? Because then you don't have to say struct date. You can just say the date. See the difference? So if we leave this off, if I leave off this, and I leave off this, then every time I create a variable of this type, I have to say struct date. All right. But when I do it, if I type def it, so if I say type def, so what I'm saying is an, another name for struct date is the date. So now I can come in here and have, rather than having to say struct date, I can just say the date. If you say, well, it's not a big thing, then don't do it. But I'm telling you, there's a boatload of C code out there that people type def everything. So if you turn up to page 169 in the book and you take a look in there, you've got another program, determining tomorrow's date. Now think about the work that's involved in this, not for you and me, but think about the work that's involved for a typical computer working on this. So notice what we've done here. This, this is something you I don't think we've seen before. And that is, that is an array that's a constant. So in other words, days per month sub 0 is always equal to 31. Days per month sub 1 is always equal to 28. Get the idea? You see a problem with this the way it currently stands? Leap year. There's no leap year validation, which, which they'll do later. But the point is, what they're saying is just assuming for a second that there's always 28 days in February. We want to set this up, and then we have to start being smart. I'm not going to run through this code with you right here, right now, but what they're saying is, okay, what, when you enter the date, if you enter it like this, month, month, day, day, year, 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 you have to worry about, for example, if I put in here 0, 01, 31, 2014, then I have to make sure that the next day, when I add 1 to it, it's going to be 0, 02. In other words, the month has to change. On the other hand, if I type in here 12-31-2014 and I add one day to it, it's got to change to 0 one 0 one 2015 Does that make sense? So that what they're putting in here is they're trying to set it up basically so that you're always able to. So when you run this program and you put in this, for example, it gives you the right output. If you put in this, it gives you the right output. Again, as I mentioned, Putting in 1231 will change both the month and the day and the year. You'll always be changing the day. You might be changing the month. And it's only on December 31st that you'll be changing the year. Does all that make sense? So that's what they're checking in here. I'll let you take a look at that yourselves. It really is fairly straightforward, at least, when you take a look at it. So now, on the, if you turn up to the bottom of page 171, and then going on to 172, now they are going to take into account leap years. And there's different ways that this can be done. It starts out the same as what you saw before. Notice that there, since they're going to be working with Booleans, there is an STD bool that you can use. All right. Now, there's not guaranteed that that's going to work with every version of C. I'm just telling you that right now. Yes. Okay, all right, then remind me when we get done, and we'll go through a couple, all right? So, what are we doing here? There's that struct date, to struct date. So we want that variable, one call today and one call tomorrow. They'll both be of type struct date, so both of them will have an integer for the month, an integer for the day, and an integer for the year. All that makes sense? This is the same stuff we saw before. All right, but now as we come through here, notice what we're doing. We are setting it up. All right, that um, 
it's 28, but we're checking and we're saying if it's a leap year and it's two, then we're going to reset those days to 29. Does that make sense? So every, not every four years, because it's not a leap year every four years. All right. If it's a year that ends on the 100, it has to be divisible by both, both 400 and 100. All right, so 2100 will not be a leap year. Not to sound too man, mean, but I'm not going to worry about that because that would make me 143. So I probably won't see that year, all right? So there's our is leap year check. Is it divisible by 4 and either divisible by 100? You know, do the check. All right, so notice if you put in 228, 2004, it is a leap year. 228, 2005 is not a leap year. So all they've done is they've written the same program in figure 9-3 on pages 171, 172, and 173, but they added leap year capability into it. Does that make sense? All right. Then they revise it yet again. So we'll take a look on 174 and 175. They keep trying to add a little bit more functionality to it all the time as they're doing this. Now, to show you this, if you look, you know this, that's a function, right? And that's a function that returns a date update, which is a structure of type date. In addition, that function gets passed into it a structure of type date that's called today in here. It's pretty much the same program as last time, but what they're showing is it is possible to both pass a structure into a function and return a structure from a function. All right? So they're changing all that stuff in here, and they return it right there. So they call it tomorrow, and they do all their dinging around with it, and they return it. Also, what gets passed in is today, and there's the check for it. So again, it's pretty much the same program as the one we just saw. But again, I believe the author is trying to show you here that it is possible both to pass a structure into a function and return a structure from a function. That, then he adds a little bit to it here on 177. He says, well, what about a structure for time? All right. So you already saw this. You already saw that. So I could pretty much, let's, let's, let's even leave that out because the, the author hasn't been showing it really. So we'll leave that there. We'll put that there. All right. Now I'm going to copy this. So now I can come in here, and if I want to, I can come in and I can create structures of the date, and I can create structures of the time. So maybe I wanted current date and current time. Everybody cool with that? Does that make sense to everybody? That said, what you would typically end up doing is after you create these, if I know I'm going to be doing a lot of manipulation with both of them, I'd come in here and I'd call this, I'd come in and I'd say something like struct date time. And I'd have two members in here. One, you know, I could have one that was of struct date, and I could have one that was of struct time. See the difference? So I could sit there and define a couple structures, and then I could come in and create another structure that had those structures as members. Does that make sense? All right, I think I would have to come in here and say, you know, like today, now, or something like that. All right. Well, now if I, I I'm going to try to tell me if I'm answering your question, okay? I'm going to remove all this stuff that's in here. So now I'm going to come in here and say struct date time whatever. Okay. Now I can come in here and say whatever dot today dot hour 
not hour because it's date, dot day equals 25. And I can do the same thing with the time. Whatever dot now dot minute equals 19. Bless you. That kind of thing. All right. It, you're chaining in, much, in many ways, yes. So they show a time one. I'm not going to go over it on 178 and 179 because it's very similar to what we saw before. All right. And then they mentioned going back to what we looked at before with like this struct date. If you turn up to page 180 in the book or you look up on the screen here, that when you create a structure like this, you can also initialize it at the same oops, at the same time you create it. Be real careful if you're going to do that, and make sure that if it's expecting three things, you give it three, not more and not less. Because if it's expecting three things and you give it eight, you have no idea what the what it's going to do. Does that make sense? You know, it's the old, it's expecting three pounds worth, and you're trying to shove 30 pounds into a three-pound bag type of an idea. All right? So it'll handle it as best it can. In much the same way, if it's expecting three, don't give it two. Because what it might do is it might say, oh, you, be, you only gave it two, so just use that next memory location, which could have garbage in it. All right. <clears throat> so its value is undefined, and they say that in there, okay? All right. Then they get into talking about compound literals. I'm not sure why, because I've never used these. But it says you can assign one or more values to a structure in a single statement using what are called compound literals. So notice what they're saying. Today equals, basically, they're setting it up the same way that they did before, but what they're doing first is they are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, casting it to make sure it's all of the right type. Okay. You don't have to do that, so I'm not sure exactly why they're doing it like that, except to show you that when you do it like that, you can use the dot notation. All right. There's a lot of things you can do with this language like there are in other languages that just because you can do them doesn't mean that you necessarily want to do them. All right. And then going back to what we just looked at, as I mentioned before, you can have an array of structures. So notice, for example, we've got a structure called birthdays of type 15. So notice if, they're of, if that's, that's of, of type date, so it's birthdays, then it's, so this would be the second element in their dot month and dot day and dot year. So again, what this is saying is you, have, you set up a structure, then you create an array of those structures. What you're going to see in a minute is you can also have a structure with arrays in there as elements. All right? And if you say this doesn't make a lot of sense, we're going to go over some examples on Wednesday. All right? Because I don't think the examples that were in this chapter were particularly stellar. All right, starting on the bottom of 185, this is what I was getting to you with you before, structures containing structures. All right, so notice they create that date and time, which holds a date structure called S date and a time structure called S time. And then you create something of that type, then it's event.sdate dot something equals whatever you want it to, e to equal. All right. For instance, there's event date dot s date dot month. All right. It it actually makes a lot of sense when you sit and take a look at it. All right. It's funny. I asked one of the first year people. They said they were kind of struggling with some of the stuff, and I said, "Have you read the book yet?" No. Well, either a you should be that honest, or b you should read the book. All right. All right, just as we saw an array of structures, structures can contain arrays. There's an example right there. So now it looks like it did before, but before we saw the array thing before the dot, now it's after the dot. Not only that, you can have an array of structures where the structure members hold arrays. So in other words, you could end up, if you had a bunch of these, instead of having something that looked like this, you could end up, I'm just going to move down towards, you know, give myself some room here. You could have something that looked like this. So that's the first character in the name 
of the first element of a month? The question was, you know, does it, the, does, it, does it slow things down? It doesn't slow down the computing speed at all. All right, because it's all working with addresses anyway. It all gets, it all gets basically reconciled to addresses. But it can get where it, you start to get so many dots that are in there that it gets confusing, and you may not be doing what you think you're doing. All right, the system, you know, as, as, as I was telling the first-year people last hour, the system always does whatever you tell it to do as much as it can. I mean, if you tell it something that's convoluted because you didn't get it, yeah, you can screw things up. But if you put it in there syntactically correct, no, it's not going to slow it down at all. And these are used a lot because they can be actually pretty fast. And that's it for structures. All right, so I went through that quickly. I understand that. And I'm not saying, I'm not even going to say, did that totally make sense? But I think when we go over an example, a more in-depth example on Wednesday, and you'll have the code right in front of you, all right, then I think it'll make more sense to you. So I'm going to turn up the chat to chapter 10, which starts on page 195, and we'll see how much of that we can get out of the way here before the break. Because chapter 11, strings, or I'm sorry, pointers, is the hardest chapter in any book. It's the hardest chapter in any C book, is a chapter on pointers. All right? So this is on character strings. All right? And again, the author has mentioned this before. I want you to understand these two things that the author mentions here. So I'm going to leave that up here as best I can. Cut down the size here. Come on. So you see those examples that are right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replicate those examples. I'm going to say this. Char plus sign equals single quote plus sign single quote. And then uh, char, I, and I have to say bracket two, all right, plus sign two equals double quote plus sign double quote. All right, and it may not look like a big thing, but it's important that you realize the difference between these. Let me move that over. This one literally will look like in memory someplace a plus sign. Okay, no biggie. This one will look like a plus sign and have a backslash zero at the end because the second one is a string. And why is that important? It's important because I can't use any of the functions that are in the header file called string.h. I can't use it on that one. I can only use it as a single character. But if I go out, so here's string.h. I just grabbed the first one that's here. So all this stuff, I can now use all those by including string.h, but I can only use it on the second example. I cannot use it on the first. Because the first one's not a string. It's a character literal. All right. If I do this, which I should never do, but if I do that, now it also looks like that. All right. And I can't technically use, because the system needs that backslash zero to know when the string ends. You should never do that. It's much better to do this and make it way too big than it is to do that. All right. And that's a lot of the beginning of the chapter on 196 and 197. They talk about arrays of characters, and that's kind of the stuff they're talking about. They say, hello, and they say a character word if you do this that you see up there now in kind of pink or orangish, that's going to make it an array. All right, but it's going to be a character string automatically by doing this if you, you know, because we didn't put a size in there. So the system will automatically put the backslash. I'll say that again. This is a character array, it's not a string. Notice there's no backslash zero in there. All right. And again, you might say, well, who cares? You care if you want to be able to use these string functions, then you want to make it a string. Unlike Java, which has a data type of string, C does not have one. All right. 
whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, you know, that's up to you to decide, I guess. All right. Then they talk on, on 198 and really getting into it on 199. They talk about variable length character strings, and there's that backslash zero. But again, if you're setting it up, if you are setting it up like you see at the top of the page here, right there, near the top of the page, if you are setting that up, if you don't put that backslash zero in, the system doesn't know that it's a string. Notice also there's no number that's put inside of those brackets. That's what's recommended, like it is in other languages. Let the system figure out that there's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven locations, locations zero through six. If I run the length function on there, it gives me six. Did you all hear that? H-E-L-L-O exclamation point. It doesn't count that backslash zero. That's a terminator. That lets me know that the string is now done. All right. And there's a lot of very, they, they try, he tries to write his own simple little string functions in here. I'm not sure exactly why, because there's a lot of the stuff that he does you can basically call, but I think he does it just to show you you can. I don't know. All right, a big thing about this, and we went over this the first day, but since it was the first day, you may or may not have even heard it. And that is if we look at the program that's here on page 207. Anything look funny right here? Not ha-ha, but anything look funny right there? How about there's no ampersand before S1, S2, and S3? When you use strings, you don't put an ampersand in front because it's already implied. All right. So if you are reading in a string, and I don't know why he ran them together, percent %s, percent %s, percent %s, but he did. So he runs this program, and he types in system expansion bus, and into the first string goes system, into the second string, goes expansion, and the third string goes bus. Okay. Now, what you're going to find is if you end up working with single character input, or if you want to read in a character at a time, this is on page 208. Okay, so if you want to be able to read a string in character at a time, quite often you'll be using this. And we looked at this in an example the other day, get chart. That literally means that, reading it in a character at a time. So if you want to read it in at a character at a time, you'll typically put it into a loop. So look at the loop that they have here. And it's an important enough concept that we spend a minute or two going over it. So in English, what this is saying is go through this, loop through this until, in this case, they're not even checking for backslash zero. They're checking for backslash n. So loop through it until the user hits the enter key. All right? So as long as the character they've entered was not the enter key, okay, that, that get char is looking for this. So go through it and throw it into a buffer. So what that does, you might say, I don't get it. Who cares? What that's doing is instead of having this be a string, now it's an array. You're throwing it into an array that's called buffer. So why would you want to do that? Because there's things you can do with arrays that you can't do with strings, just like there's st things you can do with strings that you can't do with arrays. Now, one more, one, one more thing. I'll take your question. If you remember in PHP the other day, we talked about explode and implode. That, that's kind of the way you do it here. All right, yes. Okay, a good question is, why would you want to put single characters into an array? How about that uh, I'm, I'm running through this, and they're not showing it in this example, okay? What I'm about to tell you, they're not showing it in the example. But what if I told you to, if, if you're running JavaScript, see if you remember this from last year, you're running JavaScript, and you do a uh, prompt statement with a parse int on it, okay? And I put in 128s, is that valid? Yeah, it is. Because as long as the first, you know, it goes one, two, eight, those are valid, 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 then it hits yes, it says it's invalid, I'm done. 
What if I want to do the same thing in C? If I said percent %i and I'm checking it a character at a time, as soon as it hits, it, it looks at it as a total, as an integer. But now if I do this, I can break it up and I can check the 1. It's okay, let it go through. I can check the 2. It's okay, I can let it go through. I can check the 8. It's okay, I can let it go through. I check the S. It's not okay, so I throw it away. You can't do that unless you check it a character at a time. It's, it's a way that you can, you can do it through for validation. Yeah, Parsing, validating, whatever you want to call it. Oh, it, it, depends on, it depends on what you're doing with it. All right, remember that before I can do this, the computer can run through that 10,000 times. Before I do this, it can run through it a million times. So it depends on, I mean, if I was gonna sit there and grab everything in the Library of Congress and I was gonna do it a character at a time, yeah, because that's got billions and, and more of characters, many terabytes. But if it's for the things that most people are going to do, this is one way of doing some crude, fairly simplistic validation. All right. Yeah, I'd be coming in here, and they have like is alpha type of stuff and is digit type of stuff. All right. Yes. Yes. No, it's, it's filling the array. It's doing it right here. And so the first thing we're telling it to do is grab the character. The next thing we're telling it to do is to, to take that character and throw it into our array that's called buffer. Then we're telling it to increment our index. All right, remember, it always does that. Then it's checking to see, oh, is that character that you just put in a backslash n? If it is, it says don't put any more in. Yes. So it, in other words, if I put in hello, and then I hit the return key, that's actually what's in there. So if I wanted to make sure, if I wanted to go in afterwards and look at that, I would go in and I would tell it to start at the beginning and end at the length minus one. Because the chances are I wouldn't want to deal with this. I only want to deal with this, right? All right. Does all that make sense? All right, turning up to page 213, he talks about the null string. It says, next consider a more practical example of the use of being able to count the number of words you had in here. It says, this time you make use of your read line function to allow the user to type in multiple lines of text at the terminal window. The program then counts the number of words in the text and displays the result. That actually is something you can use. All right. So let's say that Mike, instead of... Uh, Twitter, he makes his own type of thing, and he's going to allow people more than 140 characters. He thinks that's not enough, so he's going to create his own version where you can have 500 characters. That's where you could use something like this. And you'd allow it to keep going, but once they exceeded 500, you just wouldn't take the input anymore. You'd say you're done. All right. Now, you could do that in a lot of ways, and here they count the number of words in a text. You could do it that way, too. Let's say that, I, for example, that my input that they show in the program here that's on pages 214 and 215, what if my input was the Constitution? All right, and I will tell you, I remember back when I was in junior high, we had to memorize the preamble for the Constitution, you know, we the people, type, all that stuff. And I think, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think one of the things we had to know was how many words were in it, so we had to sit there and count it. And now, again, I'm talking to you back in like 19, late 60s, we didn't have a nice little program like this you could use. So you sat there, and at, at that time I didn't have these, so at least I had eyes that could sort of see, but you had to count that. All right. Now you just grab the file. I could tell you now, faster than that, how many words are in the entire Constitution. All right. So there are reasons that you'd use things like this. You know, again, okay, so I sit there and I type in something. You know, For, for instance, Word has this built in, whether you know it or not. Word tells you how many words you have in there. All right. So if, if instead of giving you a 10-page paper on, on uh, cell phone etiquette in the classroom, Dave Guile decides to make it 1,000 words, you can just sit there and type it in and then check every once in a while and do a word count. It is doing something similar to this is what I'm telling you. And I'm not sure what Word is written in, but I would guess that Word is probably written in C++. 
And what they would use to do this is something fairly similar to what you're seeing right here. All right, not quite as crude. Somebody has, has written it and put it in a library someplace. All right, uh, turning up to 216, again, this is something that shouldn't be new to any of you, your escape characters. This one I don't think works anymore because this is an old book. All right, I probably have told you my story about this already, but I, it bears repeating because it was funny as hell. I shouldn't laugh, but it was funny as hell. All right, Dave, the lab assistant, wrote something like this. Um, int i or x equals 1. While x greater than 10. Print F. Now I'm breaking all sorts of rules here. First of all, that's an infinite loop, whether you realize it or not. Because I'm starting at 1 and I'm saying while well, it's greater than 10, but I'm subtracting from it every time. This says, put, ring the terminal bell and put it into an infinite loop. Now that used to work here until I had to manually disable it because students were doing that to one another if you weren't locking your machine. So you'd walk in and you'd, you'd, write, you'd, you'd sit there and you'd start up a program and you'd hear and, you know, and pretty soon there'd be five or six of them coming off in the same room and somebody would be walking by saying what the hell's going on in here or wondering if a fire alarm went off or whatever. But the first time a guy did that I had to admit I just laughed my butt off but he did it to a, to a young woman in the class who started crying because she thought she broke something. And I'm trying not to laugh because it's funny as hell, but, and I'm trying to reprimand him, but he's looking at me, he's like, you think it's funny? You think it's really funny and you're trying not to laugh? And I, eventually I did just start laughing. So, and she felt real bad and ran out of the room. Um, why the author decides to show you this here, I'm not positive, but if you look, because it's kind of an important concept, if you do this, what you see right here, you'll get an error message. So if you get up to Z and you hit the enter key, you with me? So you get up to that, that lowercase Z and you hit enter and then you put the uppercase stuff in because you broke a string in the middle of the string. That'll break in Java too. But if you do this, if the last character that you put on that second line is a forward or is a backslash, that's a line continuation character. All right, and I think it'll work in Java also. I don't remember. All right. There's actually prob probably the first program that's in this chapter that's actually worth talking about for a second or two. It starts on page 221. It's real simplistic, but what it is is it says, here's your dictionary. You've got 10 terms in it. Okay, so they're literally setting up a dictionary. Okay, you notice it, it goes up to 100, but there's only 10 terms in it now. And then what you can do is you can sit there and tell them that you want to look up a word. You enter the word, and as long as it's aardvark or abyss or acumen or addle, et cetera, as long as it's one of those, it'll come back and it'll give you the definition that goes with it. But if you put in a word like hello, it'll come back and it'll say, if you look on the next page, it'll say something along, sorry, the word hello is not in my dictionary. You understand that? So there's the run. This is actually something you could use. now. You might say, I would never use it. No, but imagine you were writing your own bit of software. You might write a children's program that, I'll take your question in a second, that would maybe teach them certain words. All right, something like that. So there actually are uses for this. Albeit in the example they show here, it's kind of a dumb example. But just so you know, it actually is something that you could, could potentially end up using. No, uh, right now there is no autocorrect. You'd have to build that in. That, that could be really problematic and really difficult. One of the first things you'd probably do when you look at this, one of the first things I do, and they didn't do it in here, I don't think, is I would take that what's in here, and whatever you input, I would immediately change it and, and put it to lowercase. Because if somebody puts aardvark and it says, what's well, an aardvark, say so start with a capital A, now it'll say that's not in the dictionary. That's the first thing. All right. The, uh, but one way around that, the first thing that comes to my mind is I'd create another array 
that had things that were spelled similar to this and throw all of them in there. Yes, that's what, that's what we're looking at in just a second. Yeah. Yeah, you could do something like that, too. And I'm not sure if this is what you mean or not, Zane, but again, when you look in here, what they talk about next, turning up all the way to 229, converting a string to its integer equivalent. So, for instance, now that's the dumb example, but you could do it with a regular string, too. Yeah, you could do that. Now, most users would find that confusing, and you'd have to go and look at all the values that are near that, and then you'd have to fig figure out a range that you thought was a permissible range, because what you're going to find is, for example, aardvark is going to be really probably pretty close to aardvark with an L on the end, but just putting an S after the end of it, aardvarks, it's going to be pretty different. So that it depends. There are ways that it could be done, yes, but it would involve some work. All right. And that's it for this chapter. So before we take a break, just give me a couple minutes. This is what we looked at last time, all right? So I want to make sure that, that what you said before, before, Mike, is what I'm answering. So again, when you get on here, yeah. All right. All right, and there are, there are other ways to compile than the way I've shown you. So if you learn, go out and learn another one, I don't really care. I have no way of knowing how you compiled something anyway. When you are all done and you're handing in your actual homework, I don't want this junk, and I don't want this junk. I only want your C programs. You can put it in there. So in other words, this is the link file and that's the execute. No, that's the link file and that's the executable. All right. But I don't want your link and your executable. I'm going to recompile all of them. All right. You can say, why don't you trust us? I've learned over time to to watch how I trust people because I in the in back in the olden days I would just run theirs and it would work because this had error in it but that one didn't. All right. Then I started to look and I thought, wow, this says 8-21-2014, and that one says something way before it or something way after it. That sounds like it could be a little problematic. I just want your C file. That's it. All I want is your C file. Throw it in there. Notice if I double click on the one that looks like a little, I don't know what you call it, not, not the one down here, but the other one runs the program. Boom, there it is. But you saw how well it ran it. it boom, it does the executable. So when you actually do your CL, it's creating this one. That's your link file. And when you run the link file, it's creating that one. All right, that makes sense? All right, let's take a break. We'll come back at uh, 4 o'clock, and we're going to go over Chapter 11 on pointers and see how much of that we can get done today.